asking uh, people to say and then spell their name and their position. So if okay. you do that. All right. I'm uh, <coughs> Donald Rasmussen. Uh, I'm a pulmonary physician uh, at the uh, ARH Southern West Virginia Clinic in uh, Beckley, West Virginia. And my name is spelled R-A-S-M-U-S-S-E-N. Okay, I'm going to start kind of at the beginning, mm -hmm. not at your beginning, but um, sure. by asking you why you came to West Virginia and when, when you came. Well, when I got out of the Army in 1962, I was looking for a place to practice. Primarily, I wanted to practice internal medicine, although I had my pulmonary training. I read an ad in the AMA about uh, some hospitals, uh, UMW hospitals in West Virginia, and uh, even though I had some real skepticism about this whole proposition, I, they were willing to pay my way here. And I came and uh, visited the uh, what was then the Miners Memorial Hospital in uh, Beckley here in West Virginia, and uh, I was absolutely impressed with the quality of the staff that they had that they had gathered here there were there were really competent people in every field there was uh, for example uh, a pulmonologist that had preceded me named Robert Hyatt who had I'd been reading uh, material he had uh, written in which he had actually done studies he had done here in uh, Beckley and this was very impressive we had a cardiologist who uh, was uh, an expert in arrhythmias uh, he died, when he died, the, uh, the uh, uh, American D Journal of Cardiology actually dedicated an issue of the journal to him. We had a pathologist who was doing full lung sections or Goff sections, uh, which is uh, something we could never get our pathologists to do. We had extremely competent uh, people in, in just about every field you could imagine. So I was, I was very impressed, plus it was a it was a very academic kind of setting. It was a salaried position, which I thought was good. And uh, so I, I was um, immediately impressed and decided that, that was fine with me. What did you think about me, West Virginia? Uh, let me stop you for one second. Okay, Sherlyn. Okay. Um, How did you feel about West Virginia? Well, I arrived uh, at the airport in Charleston and, and actually took a bus. I found out I should have taken the express bus, but in fact, it took me through uh, up through Golly Bridge and Oak Hill, and I was it was in October of 1962, and I was absolutely flabbergasted at the beauty. The, I don't think the uh, autumn leaves have been uh, nearly as beautiful since that time. My only concept of West Virginia had been in some of the old newsreels. Uh, for example, of John L. Lewis standing by a mine disaster and, and dirty-looking coal miners and gr grimy, grimy-looking surroundings. And when I saw the, the mountains and the, and the leaves, I, I was absolutely, uh, totally impressed. I thought it was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen, really. So you decided to take the position. Yes. And why did you stay? Well, I stayed for those reasons that you they say that I wanted to. Actually, I wanted to practice general internal medicine, even though I had my specialty training in pulmonary disease. I really did not come here with the intention of practicing pulmonary medicine. I like internal medicine. I was not particularly encouraged about uh, treating people with uh, chronic obstructive lung disease. Uh, this was not very satisfactory experience back in those days, and more fun to do internal medicine. I wonder if you could have any recollections from the early, your early years in the, um, in the hospital, Myers Memorial Hospital, in the clinics, um, that you could talk about in terms of the people you worked with, the minors, that you said that sure. you were real interested in the sure. obstructive lung disease, but something must have well, the first place, uh, of course, I, I found the, the, the medical staff to be uh, very competent. It was a very comfortable setting. It was, it was very enjoyable. The, <clears throat> before I came here, uh, one of my classmates and some of his uh, partners in the clinic uh, had tried to persuade me to stay there in, in uh, Utah. 
And uh, they said, now, I'll give you three months and you won't be able to stand those damn coal miners. And uh, I was, when I came here, I, I, it was very obvious that these coal miners were some of the greatest people that you could ever imagine. People who worked under ex such hard, hard conditions, even many of them with uh, severe impairments, uh, and continued to do this year after year, and people were friendly. I mean, it was it was a just thing. I was it was a complete turnaround from what I had thought or what I had been told would be the case. So I was uh, I was you know very very uh, I felt very comfortable. It was an, it was a very good feeling to be here. You obviously became involved with <laughs> chronic obstructive yes. disease. Yes. How? Uh, well. Of course, I enjoyed internal medicine. My first year here, for example, I found three cases of uh, hyperparathyroidism, which uh, in those days was not a very common condition. Uh, very interesting, some very interesting thyroid problems. But the thing that began to impress me was the number of people, coal miners, who had lung disease, and the many of miners who were quite symptomatic. Uh, and these were honest people. These were not uh, anybody that was goof-offs or anything of the kind. And I was impressed with how much problems these people had. I was also impressed, I thought, with the fact that in the I had been at the uh, at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, and the, I was the chief of the pulmonary section there. We had a, actually a large VA uh, population of veterans. And there were many, many people with chronic lung disease, the typical cigarette smoking problems. Well, we would see these people uh, would develop a decompensation. They would come in, they'd be treated, they'd go back out, and it was sort of like a repetitive thing. But when I came here, I felt that these people who became decompensated uh, did not last long. They didn't seem to have the bounce. I felt that they had a lot more evidence of vascular disease, and pulmonary hypertension. Um, and, and I was, was impressed with that. I, I was impressed with uh, the fact that uh, uh, many of these miners had, uh, had symptoms uh, with or without many x-ray findings, and even with normal or only mildly abnormal breathing or ventilatory function studies or breathing tests, and yet they were symptomatic. Now, I had been, uh, I had been in the Army <coughs> And uh, when I was in my chest training in Denver, Fitzsimmons, we had seen uh, a fair number of individuals with uh, uh, somewhat unusual types of disease. After all, the Army had like uh, five million uh, troops, dependents, and the funny diseases or the unusual diseases were like funneled into Fitzsimmons or other places like that. So we saw cases mostly what would now be classified as uh, diffuse interstitial fibrosis. And we knew that some of those people could have perfectly normal breathing studies, but yet when you did exercise studies, you found that they did have abnormalities in their ability to oxygenate their blood. And uh, so I became intrigued with this. And uh, in, uh, uh, within, I guess, uh, uh, six months after I came here, I persuaded the uh, powers it be to get uh, a blood gas analyzer and uh, we began to study these miners with exercise studies and very quickly found that many of the miners had a lot of the same types of findings that those individuals with the uh, various types of fibrosis had and that of course whetted my appetite a good deal more to just look into this further. Those, <clears throat> those studies, in fact, were what different, differentiated some of the work, your work from some other work being done, wasn't it? I mean, that seemed to make well, a difference. In well, when you go back and look at, at, at what had been happening in the world, you, you, you find that um, um, uh, at really about the same time, people, for example, in Belgium were finding that uh, coal miners had the same basic type of abnormality. Some of them did. Now, not a lot of them. As a matter of fact, what one group had done was to take miners, who, working miners, who had no evidence of bronchitis, you know, the usual chronic obstructive lung disease, and they found that some of those had a impairment in their ability to oxygenate their blood as well. 
the, the, and, the, and the difference between uh, those findings and the typical, say, cigarette smoking effect was that ordinarily you wouldn't see this pattern with somebody who didn't have uh, in difficulty getting this air in out of his lungs, um, it, it, which is what you'd usually expect with cigarette smoking. Mm -hmm. So this was, was intriguing to me, and this is uh, what really stimulated me to keep, uh, keep going. Now, we saw a lot of the other kind of patients with uh, airway obstruction and so forth, the typical chronic obstructive lung disease, but this kind of a pattern was uh, somewhat unique. And that, uh, that's what the diff difference was. Can you remember some of your early patients? That, sure. That you, you, you talked about um, one person that you became friends with. Um, well, do you have any recollections of, of anyone in particular that you could talk about in terms of? Oh, sure. I, I, can, I can remember people that we saw uh, that uh, had, had a lot of impairment uh, uh, over the years. Uh, I can remember people who initially did not have much impairment, who now have severe impairment. Uh, uh, I remember one individual, I guess we saw him in the, uh, in the uh, late 60s, uh, a man named Levi Daniel, who was one of my very best friends, who had severe impairment then, who continued to, to uh, be active. He was, uh, he was very active in the United Mine Workers' political uh, struggles, even for a time was a president of District 29, uh, continued to be as active as he could possibly be, but his disease had finally got him and he, he died not long ago. But there were others, I still see many of those that, that are here now, but a great, great many have died along the way. Um, <clears throat> how, many think, how many miners do you think you've examined since you've been here? Well, in, in, in fair detail, uh, probably close to 45 or 50,000 at this stage. And how many of those that you um, examined, and could you read into it like I've examined so many and so many have had this, had this. do you have a sense of how many of them showed signs of um, uh, co-workers and pneumoconiosis? Well, a good many of them have shown signs of pneumoconiosis, for example, x-ray findings. Probably the majority of those, at least when we evaluated them, did not have any significant impairment. The same thing goes, it holds true today. But at one stage, um, probably a quarter of the minors that we saw had say sufficient impairment that they would qualify for the federal black lung standards. That's not the most severe standards, but probably at one stage about that many would, would qualify. Now, those were minors primarily who had worked long before there was any kind of dust control in the mines. Since that time, the, the number has diminished, the ones that are repaired have diminished significantly, which is, which is of course a gratifying thing. So it's hard to say exact percentages of how many people, but there were there were probably a quarter that uh, that, that were that sufficiently impaired that they uh, met the Department of Labor standards at least. When did you begin to find yourself in disagreement with um, others within the medical community in terms of the diagnosis of coal workers and coniosis? Well, there's. Probably um, became quite apparent in say about 1968. Uh, uh, we'd already published one uh, one article in the, in the literature, but uh, in 1968 the uh, the coal miners had they had attended the United Mine Workers uh, Convention International Convention in Denver, and at that convention. Dr. Lauren Kerr, who was, uh, had been a great advocate of coal miners' lung diseases for a number of years in the United Mine Workers Union, the Welfare, Welfare and Retirement Fund, had spoken at that convention. The interest in lung disease was quite rampant among the miners. In that convention, about half of the local unions throughout the country 
had put in, submitted resolutions to talk about the lung disease. And Lauren Kerr gave a, a very stirring uh, speech. It enthused the miners from West Virginia who had been there. They came back here, and this was, the meeting was in September, and they immediately began to uh, look around and see what was, what was happening. And about the same time, there was a, a Dr. I.E. Buff, who uh, was beginning to make all kinds of public statements about uh, lung disease in coal miners. And uh, uh, he was on television, he was making quite a bit of noise. The miners uh, began to tr try to organize meetings where they could, you know, for example, organize meetings where they would have the uh, candidates for the state legislature that was going to be an election that November, have them come and uh, hear various people talk. And Dr. Buff had been doing his uh, traveling around speaking, but, a, but a, a group of local union presidents came to me and asked me if I would go and speak at some of their uh, meetings, uh, which I agreed to do. And uh, turns out that they had also invited Dr. Buff, so the two of us began to speak. And subsequently, Dr. Wells was invited into the group. Dr. Wells was a pathologist who had, in fact, worked not only with pathology, but had been on some of the field teams in the public health service uh, in the, when I was in the public health service then. Uh, and we began to speak to the miners, explaining to them what, what we thought was the situation with type of lung disease. Well, this drew the ire of a number of people in the uh, medical community, and uh, uh, we were roundly condemned and censured and all sorts of things. Uh, so that was that was when really the first thing really kind of hit the fan. But before that, even see, I became interested enough in in the problem of uh, this this the coal miners. So when after I had begun to study biters in 1963, there were a group in the, in the hospital there that had been doing studies. Uh, Dr. Hyatt and Kiston and Mahan had published a, a report in, in 1964 on their, some of their studies that they had done on Raleigh County coal miners, which is the county we're in here. And uh, the group was still active, even though uh, Dr. Kiston and Mahan had, I mean, Dr. Uh, Hyatt and Mahan had left. Uh, and they, they actually got me interested and finally convinced me to, uh, to uh, uh, actually quit my job, which I did at a loss of about $3,000 a year, and join the public health service. And I spent two years in the public health service, and uh, at that time I, I had two basic jobs. One was to travel throughout the Appalachian coal fields where we had two field teams uh, that were out. One, one was one was, they started in, in uh, uh, Alabama and came up this way, and another started in mid-West mid Virginia and moved up into Pennsylvania. And my job was to precede the teams, to talk to the local medical people, the UMW people, the Bureau of Mines people, and the, and the uh, coal operator people. And uh, I did that for time. And then the other one was, uh, it gave me an opportunity to do more studies in the laboratory with patients. And so I did that for uh, two years, and that was the basis of a lot of uh, my opinion. Well, Dr. Wells had, was one of the initial physicians on one of the field teams, and then he finished his pathology training at, uh, at the uh, hospital with Dr. Werner LaCour, who was the pathologist who had been doing research on the, the pathology of coal miners' lung disease even before I got there, you see. So it was just kind of a thing like that. But at any rate, uh, uh, the, 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 then the three of us sort of were put together in this group and we traveled all over the a area uh, talking to coal miners. <coughs> I hadn't known about that. That's well, your that, career. Well, that, that, that was a, uh, my, uh, my job was trying to uh, bring a little reality into the situation. Doctors uh, Buff and Wells were great showmen. I was kind of a straight man, and I always talked last. And I said, I tried to calm down the, you know, the exaggerations that I felt were there. But the coal miners, uh, they they didn't uh, 
they, they smiled at me. They didn't, uh, they didn't cheer like they did with the Wells and Buff, but I was kind of the straight man in that thing. Um, I want to go back to, there was a point in time where, um, where, where you, were, you had funding from the federal government, right, to, to study disease, and then it moved to Morganton. Oh. Well, see, when I was in the public health service, the, it was in the old division of occupational health, the public health service, and that was, I worked there. I was, I was the chief of the, uh, chief medical officer of what was called the Appalachian Coal Miners Research Unit, which was established in the hospital uh, that was, it started off as the Miners Memorial Hospital, but was then became Appalachian Regional Hospital. So I was there, and, and that was the funding was from the public health service then. Uh, then, in, in, uh, in 1966, they decided to move the uh, operation to uh, Morgantown to be in conjunction with the uh, Western University, which was a you know, sensible thing. At that time, I elected not to leave and not to go to Morgantown. And the reason, there were a couple of reasons. First of all, we had so many minors that, that needed to be studied, needed to be evaluated. And I wanted to keep on doing what we were doing. Um, uh, and I knew that uh, things would take a long time to get set up in Morgantown. So I elected to stay here and, and resign from the Public Health Service. And that's when we first established a, 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 a laboratory independent of the Public Health Service. And for a year or so, we, we had some kind of funding to collect, basically collect blood samples and send some records to, to them in Morgantown. And then after that, we were, had no connection or no f uh, federal funding at all. And it was simply, uh, initially, initially the uh, United Mine Workers Welfare and Retirement Fund uh, agreed to help us get equipment and, and then uh, pay, basically pay the difference between our expenses and, uh, 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 just, in other words, a certain percentage above our expenses. And well, that's how it really got started. But that shift to Morgantown made a difference in, in um, it seems to me that the research coming out of Morgantown was, if not in opposition to yours, was I mean, there definitely was disagreement. Well, there was, there, well, there was a good deal of, uh, of disagreement. Even when I was in the public health service, the, the people in charge were heavily influenced by uh, the opinions of the British. And the British had done a good deal of work long before we ever started in this country. And they, they had concluded a long time ago that uh, the only type of, uh, of uh, lung disease that really caused uh, disability was complicated pneumoconiosis with large masses in the lungs. And they based that on a, on a study that was done by, by Gilson and Hugh Jones, who were excellent uh, uh, researchers and investigators. And what they had done was they had, uh, they had taken, uh, first of all, they took x-rays from a thousand coal miners that they had evaluated in their surveys. They were doing surveys. This was in the late 40s and early 50s. And of that thousand working coal miners, they selected the best examples of dip, given categories of pneumoconiosis. No pneumoconiosis, suspect, and category one, two, or three. They couldn't find any cases of complicated pneumoconiosis or the ones with large opacities. But that was because those people had been removed from the mines of their extras or that, but they took them out and maybe put them to work somewhere else. So they, they needed to have some examples of uh, complicated pneumoconiosis or progressive massive fibrosis. So they went to a nearby clinic and hospital and searched through their records and found those cases with complicated pneumoconiosis. And then they did various, very elaborate studies. And what they found was that all those with no pneumoconiosis or simple pneumoconiosis were really pretty healthy. They didn't have much of a thing wrong with them. But the majority of those that were in the clinic and the hospital with complicated pneumoconiosis had rather significant impairment. And they concluded, therefore, that the only type of impairment, the only time impairment occurs is when you have complicated uh, pneumoconiosis. Well, if you look at it from the point of view of, of uh, you know, of, uh, epidemiology, 
that's not a very good way to do it because uh, you were picking the healthiest survivors, the ones that didn't have any symptoms, who had simple pneumoconiosis, plus in comparing them with the worst cases of complicated pneumoconiosis, who not only had been taken out of the mines, but were so sick they had to be seen in the hospital and the clinic. And that's, that's what happened. So, so uh, and I continue to you know, disagree with even my, my superiors in the public health service. In fact, as a matter of fact, uh, they finally published the, uh, the report on the survey of Appalachian coal miners. And in, in preparation for that, I had given them some examples of coal miners with simple pneumoconiosis who, in fact, had significant impairment in function. When they finally published this thing, several years after the Coal Mines Act, Act was published, they had deleted those cases, but it, they gave me credit for supplying them at the end. But at any rate, that was the situation it was. And the difference that I had with the people in Morgantown uh, was that uh, simple coal workers pneumoconiosis can and does produce disabling lung disease, and that was the thing. And of course, they did a lot of studies up there, epidemiologic studies, and they came to their conclusions. And it's really only been in in, uh, say, uh, the last uh, maybe 15 to 20 years that uh, the facts have seemed to change. And now it's, it's, uh, it isn't a question of whether they have uh, simple or complicated. Complicated is obviously a bad disease. But a good number of individuals with simple pneumoconiosis or even some without any x-ray evidence can have dust-induced chronic lung disease. And that's pretty well recognized pretty much all over the world. Um, so then going ahead again, uh, back into 1968 where you were, <clears throat> I read about the, I think it was your first meeting um, with you and Buff, and I don't know if Wells was Wells. there or not, but Clifftop? Uh, Clifftop, no, uh, Wells wasn't there, but Buff and I were there. What, yes. what was the Clifftop meeting? That was the first one, right? Okay, right. Well, let's stop here because we have to change tape. Oh, no, 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 batteries now. Do you have them? I've got them. Sorry. Okay, well, we can go with clip meeting or whatever you were going to do. All right, well, uh, after this group of local presidents had uh, asked me if I'd speak for them, the first invitation was to a uh, local union meeting at the Staniford local union, which was not far from the hospital uh, at, uh, in Beckley or Staniford. At that meeting, they had uh, many of the uh, candidates for the House of Delegates and State Senate. And uh, I spoke, and various other people spoke, and all the candidates spoke. All the candidates said, yes, we will, we will do all these good things for you. Of course, it didn't turn out that way. But at any rate, then the next uh, meeting that uh, was held where I was invited, and it was Dr. Buff, was at the uh, local union at Clifftop, West Virginia was up in Fayette County and that was probably the first meeting where there was a, quite a gathering of from different areas different locals uh, and that was the, the first uh, first meeting it was in the in the early fall of 1968 and what what was Dr. Buff like at that meeting? Dr. Buff was at that meeting like he was at all meetings he was a uh, a great showman. He uh, put on a magnificent thing. He he told people, "You all have black lung. You're gonna die." I mean, it was this the kind of thing he did. And he castigated the cold operators, as he called them. And uh, he he would uh, do at various meetings. He would uh, he would have two hats. He'd have a white hat and a black hat. He said. When he talks to you, he's talking about the politicians, he puts his white hat on and talks to you. And then when he talks to the cold operators, he puts his black hat on. I mean, he would rant and rave and uh, that sort of thing. And he, he did that at every meeting that, uh, that we attended. And I attended a lot of meetings with Dr. Buff. Uh, and again, as I say, that was, I was just trying to try to put a little reality into it. But I must say that Dr. Buff, uh, is probably more responsible for getting public involvement in this whole thing than anybody else because he was able to get 
local and national television people in at many of these meetings, and uh, that really actually spread the, you know, at least the fact that there was a, a, a conflict going on all, all over the country. That's what Dr. Buff did, absolutely. So what was your role? My role was, was to try to be realistic, try to tell minors that all of them didn't, you know, weren't going to have impairment, even those that had black lung weren't necessarily going to be impaired, and to try to explain, you know, how you, what we'd need to do to find out and so forth. That was basically what I was, uh, what I was doing, and urging them to, to, uh, you know, ask for changes in the, uh, the workers' compensation law. That's what they were interested in doing was to, to uh, basically liberalize the uh, the requirements for impairments in 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 the, in the workers' compensation state workers' compensation commission. That was basically what the coal miners in West Virginia were were trying to do at that stage. You brought respectability in a way. I mean, because you, this was your field, is that? Well, I, yeah, I, I, I suppose that's what I tried to do. That's what I tried to do, was to make it realistic. And uh, I mean, uh, as I say, Buff uh, and, and Wells, too, Wells was a great showman, even though he, you know, was very competent in the business. But the, the, uh, it, this whole thing attracted a lot of attention, which is, which is good, actually under the circumstances. So after Clifftop, you went to, I think it was shortly after that, you were all in Washington? No. Or where was it that you uh, Whoa, well, there were several. I guess maybe the next one was at uh, Marmette, uh, same kind of thing down in Kanawha County. Uh, I, I really don't remember all the details. Of course, in November of 1968, there was the explosion uh, Mannington, uh, which then drew national attention. Uh, that that wasn't the first time I'd been to Washington. I guess I guess in back in back even in February of 1968, before any of this began, Dr. Wells had been working with a, a House Labor Subcommittee, Select Labor Subcommittee, and he had gotten me to bring three coal miners to come and testify before that select labor subcommittee. And I brought these three coal miners, and I brought them because they had lung disease. The committee, of course, was most interested in the fact that all three of them had had severe injuries in the mines. But it turns out that, that uh, they were talking about what eventually became the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which was finally passed in 1973. This was in 1968. But they said then they, they had no, um, uh, no uh, connection with coal miners because the coal miners were under the, the uh, umbrella of the Bureau of Mines. So our testimony was not uh, pertinent. But in after the Mannington, uh, after the Mannington disaster, then uh, I, we went to Washington, and uh, there was a, a big meeting there. And I guess that was the first time that uh, that uh, I, I heard uh, Ken Heckler talk, who was congressman from the fourth uh, district in West Virginia. And from then on, it was uh, not only continuing these trips around the coal fields, but then there were quite a few episodes of testifying before Congress and so forth. But the, uh, the, uh, the meetings with the coal miners, we had meetings in McDowell County, uh, Mingo County, Logan County, Madison County, uh, Kanawha County, we even went into Pennsylvania, we had meetings in, uh, in uh, Moundsville, Fairmont. Uh, uh, all over the place. We were uh, in Pine and Wyoming County. It was a it was a constant travel around to do things like that. And, uh, and sometimes we'd have two meetings in, a, in the same day, and uh, all we could do was to try to keep up with Dr. Buff, who always got there first. And we were always scrambling to get in there and and uh, and uh, you know follow him. That was what we did. It was quite a. It was called a circus, and I guess you could call it that. But those meetings were absolutely uh, uh, in heavily attended. And there were always huge numbers of, uh, of people at those meetings because they were they were that that concerned about 
Well, you see, they can see that a lot of their fellow miners in their 40s and 50s uh, were becoming disabled. And they had you know, like kids to put through school and stuff like this, and yet they were simply not able to continue working. I mean, that, this, was, this was a significant uh, situation with those people in those days. And so they, they were concerned. They were all interested in this. Um, one of the trips when you went to Washington, is that when you formed the, your um, large group, the Physicians uh, for Miners Health and oh, Safety? Well, that, that wasn't when we went to Washington. I, uh, the, I'm not sure exactly how that uh, organization was formed, but it, it was, it was Buff and Wells and I, we were, they were, the, were part of that so-called committee. It was supposed to be a lot of other people, but there weren't. And, uh, it was sometime, uh, sometime after Mannington, because that's when Dr. Wells came back. He had, he had left the area and was actually uh, uh, working in, uh, he initially worked in Morgantown in the public health Company. then he was working in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and also in Washington with the subcommittee. And then he came back and joined us then after the Mannington disaster, and I guess that's when we formed this Miners Committee for or a committee for physicians committee for minors health and safety or something like that. What did you hope to accomplish with that group? Well, we we hoped to to liberalize the West Virginia's workers' compensation laws. After Mannington, we hoped to aid the passage of the Coal Mine Health and Safety Act of 1969, and that was the main goal. Did you ever meet um, Charles Brooks? Oh, Charlie Brooks, yes. Charlie Brooks was the first president of the West Virginia Black Lung Association. And the interesting thing about Charlie is Charlie was the only black member of his local union. He was the president of that local union. You know, he was a pretty good guy. I, I spent a lot of time with Charlie Brooks, and he was a great, great person. Charlie Brooks even mortgaged his own home to get the to help get the down payment on the funds to hire a lawyer to put the bill through into the state legislature. But the, there were a group of miners, uh, uh, I don't remember all their names, Lyman Calhoun and Ernest Riddle uh, and uh, uh, a, a couple of others, Woody Mullins and two or three others that initially got together over the, between Christmas and New Year's in 1968 and formed the West Virginia Black Lung Association. And subsequently they were joined by uh, Arnold Miller and uh, uh, G. Paul and, uh, and then, then the whole thing spread. And it was the Black Lung Association then that really took over the, uh, or the organization. They were the ones that uh, set up the meetings. They were the ones that uh, began the, the whole thing and uh, the, the uh, <coughs> some of the conflict began between the hierarchy of United Mine Workers Union and these activist coal miners. Some of the same group of local union presidents that had uh, uh, approached me had gone to the uh, district headquarters to ask them about you know, some support, and they were told, frankly, that it was none of their business, that the international was going to handle this, and uh, that was that. And then, subsequently, they forbade uh, the, anybody from holding meetings in local union halls, which, of course, was ignored by some people in uh, Logan and, uh, and, uh, and Mingo counties, uh, but uh, there was quite a conflict there. And after the Black Lung Association was formed, the UMW hierarchy said they were going to expel those individuals because they, were, they called it dual unionism, which of course was illegal. But when they saw that basically every miner in the state claimed to be a member of the Black Lung Association, they had to back down. But there was a good deal of, of, uh, of uh, conflict and friction between the uh, hierarchy. As a matter of fact, the hierarchy did not support the uh, goals of the Black Lung Association. You, you think that was because it was out of their control? I mean, they, they proposed their own bill, right? Or they were... Yes, but their bill was, uh, was no, was, was, was basically not, did not change. Basically not to change. Mm 
and they, they, they attempted to put a great deal of pressure on the Black Lung Association, as a matter of fact. It was early in 1969 that they really, things really started moving, right, within the movement and the influence that it had in, in terms of the miners throughout West Virginia. Yeah, it was, in, it was early in, in 1969, for example, when uh, uh, we had uh, a whole series of meetings in the southern part of the state. Uh, uh, we went to uh, McDowell County and uh, Mingo County and Logan County. And in Logan County, at the, at the UMW local office, or local place, they, uh, there was a kind of a conflict between some of the uh, UMW district officials and the, uh, and the miners, but nothing came to blows. But uh, there were some close calls. Uh, for example, on one occasion in Mingo County, uh, there was a kind of a ruckus, and uh, one of the miners, uh, Elmer Brown, got up and said, uh, now wait, now wait, hold on, hold on. We don't. Turns out that uh, and after he told me afterwards that uh, there was a fellow, uh, a, a fellow miner who was approaching uh, one of the politicians, and uh, afterwards he said, he said, you know, that fellow's already been to prison for murder once, and uh, they were afraid that he was going <laughs> to do harm to this uh, politician. So there were a few things like that in those days, but basically. There was no, no real violence in the black lung movement as such. Uh, there was no, for example, uh, uh, they, uh, you know, all these meetings were, were taking place and the miners then actually, the members of the Black Lung Association, uh, lobbied the state legislatures. And they had, they, they, they had the miners all over the place, they, they talked to every single uh, legislator. They had uh, they had all kinds of uh, props. They, for example, they had actually had uh, actual uh, uh, lung tissue from uh, autopsy coal miners, uh, showing awful black-looking lungs. They had uh, they, for one thing, they had a, a coffin that they carry around, saying "Black Lung Kills." And uh, uh, but they were com they were totally uh, uh, in in control. They never. Somebody said they didn't even overturn an ashtray in the whole of Capitol building. They did a very, very credible job, and they did that all on their own. Nobody, nobody advised them of anything like that, and they did that themselves. Now, then the movement from <clears throat> that kind of lobbying, trying to push for the legislation that they wanted, led to um, action throughout the coal fields throughout West Virginia. Well, see, they were they were by that time basically the whole, the whole state, the miners, the whole part of the state. Well, we they had the meetings all, in all parts of West Virginia, and it was a, you know, it was a unified thing. Um, and in fact, uh, there was a, uh, I guess the one of the hallmarks was the uh, combined uh, House and Senate Judiciary hearings on this whole proposition. And at that, at that meeting, there were three groups. There was the Black Lung Association and their proposals and their witnesses. There was the United Mine Workers Union with their experts and their proposals. And then there was the coal industry with their experts and their proposals. And what was interesting was that even though the United Mine Workers Union opposed what the Black Lung Association were doing, they had, Murray Hunter, who was a physician in Fairmont, West Virginia, was the one that was given the job of selecting the experts for the United Mine Workers Union. They selected Jethro Goff, who was a great pathologist uh, from, uh, from Britain, a guy named Eugene Pendergrass, who was a, uh, an expert radiologist uh, from Philadelphia, expert in, in pneumoconiosis, and Leon Kander, now, Leon Kander, who, by the way, is a, a very, very good friend of mine. Leon Kander, uh, at that time, was professor of medicine and physiology at the uh, University of uh, Texas in, in San Antonio. But before that, he had been uh, uh, on the Governor Scranton's committee of, for co-workers pneumoconiosis in Pennsylvania. And uh, we presented our black lung uh, uh, association proposals and reasons and so forth. And every one 
of the experts for the United Mine Workers Union actually supported the concepts of the Black Lung Association. Jethro Goff said, simple pneumoconiosis may not kill you, but he said it can disable you. And he said, frankly, if I had simple pneumoconiosis and lived the last of my life with shortness of breath, I'd be disturbed. Dr. Pendergrass pointed out that, well, the x-ray was probably the best tool that there was, but it was imperfect. Dr. Kander said, there's no relationship between the x-ray and impairment. I mean, all these things were just exactly what we had been proposing. And then, of course, the, uh, the UMW had their, I mean, then the, uh, the coal operators had their, uh, their, their group. And after the, uh, after the thing, this was televised, by the way, all over the state. And then after the session was ended, a group of us were, were in a motel and we were looking, looking at a rebroadcast. And Leon and Kandra came over and said, uh, he said, we won, we won. But guess what? The transcript of that hearing suddenly disappeared. It didn't turn up for many years later. And that the bill that finally emerged from the Judiciary Committee was more restrictive than the bill that the coal miners were living under at that time. And that's when they began to uh, lose patience with the system, and that's when they began to rumble about uh, closing the mines. And uh, even though the, the people like Paul Kaufman, uh, who was the one that introduced the bill, uh, a guy named Warren McGraw had been working uh, with, uh, with Craig Robinson and, and uh, Rick Bank and some of the other people who had also pushed for a, a similar bill. Uh, at any rate, they were working to reintroduce uh, amendments to what came out of the House. Recently. But the coal miners, uh, uh, for some reason, and nobody, nobody will admit where it started, how it started, but all of a sudden, somebody said that uh, it was a group in, uh, in Wyoming County that, uh, that uh, a foreman had struck a miner, so these miners walked out. And then they said, well, let's close them all down. And so all they would need to do would be to walk up to a mine and, uh, and the miners would come out. And it, I guess almost all of the miners in the state walked out. And that, that closed down the thing. And they stayed out for two and a half weeks. And in the final hours of the legislative session, they, they finally passed a bill. Uh, and I was, I was at home, and Paul Kaufman was, was at the Capitol building. And he would call me up and say, well, this is what the pro proposed. This is what they proposed. And what they got out of it was a, a compromise but which significantly benefited uh, the miners. It was, it was a real step forward. And so they, they, they finally felt you know, that we were successful to some extent, got some of the important things through there. And uh, they, uh, I guess the session ended uh, Saturday evening. And on Sunday, there was a huge gathering of miners at the what was then the Woodrow Wilson High School here in Beckley. There were so many people there that uh, there was no place to park. Uh, there, there was, the entire building was filled, all the auditorium. Even there was a big stage in back of the speaking platform, and that was all filled. And there were people in the hallways and people outside. And they were discussing the fact that that was the case. And one guy got up and said, uh, well, it's pr probably time for us to go back to work. And there was this unanimous roar from the just no and they said they were not going back until uh, the governor signed that bill and in fact they didn't until it was signed I guess a couple of days later and then they went back to work but uh, that was a very dramatic uh, dramatic thing and they, they, they knew what they wanted they knew why they wanted it and it had some it had some other it had some other effects, because after Mannington, everybody knew that the mines were unsafe, and partly because of the, the uh, problem with lung disease in, in the state, 
people like Ken Heckler, who had in fact had been supportive of the miners' movement here in West Virginia. He donated money, he'd speak, spoken at rallies, and he basically was the author of the Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Act. All right, the initial idea was to include the, the problem of lung disease in coal miners in Congress. And then <clears throat> some people came along, the industry people came along and said, oh, it's too early to include uh, this business of the lung disease in coal mines. They need, need more research. And Tony Boyle, the United Mine Workers, came along and repeated the same thing and said, uh, well, it's too soon, we need more research. And this is in spite of the fact that the British had been researching uh, since the early 50s, and even before that, before the war they had started, and that was delayed until after the war. But, at any rate, then, so some of the congressmen said, well, if the industry and the union says it's too soon to debate, you know, talk about this, uh, they were going to drop it. But when they saw that all of West Virginia's coal miners walked out, and stayed out for two and a half, lost two and a half weeks of pay over a health issue, lung disease issue, they said, well, let's reconsider it. So then it was put back in, and eventually then the, uh, it was put into the law, and it was eventually then death suppression was uh, introduced and so forth. So that was, but you, you can thank basically our coal miners for what they did. Uh, they didn't do it to influence that, but that's actually what happened, and that did uh, benefit the uh, miners. <clears throat> I have a question and clarification. When you say Mannington, do you mean Farmington? Farmington, Mannington. It was Mannington it was, number nine. It was mining. Mannington number. Yeah, that's what I thought. I just yeah. wanted to make sure. Okay. I didn't think there was another big <laughs> no. disaster at that time. Let's, let's take a little break right here. How much time is it? So are you, Janet? Okay. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your relationship and work with um, the Vista volunteers. Well, the, the Vista volunteers had come in here uh, in the uh, early, mid-60s, and they, they were doing a good deal, you know, primarily with, uh, with uh, the poor people, getting them kind of organized, and getting them, trying to uh, influence them to uh, exercise their political power and so forth. And, and uh, they also then began to be independent of any of the rest of us. They began to uh, uh, talk to miners, uh, disabled miners, about uh, workers' comp and their lung disease and so forth. And so they had actually begun to have meetings. Uh, in fact, they invited me to one of their meetings with a group of disabled miners. And in those days, there were there was like a there was a see the. The origin of some of this separation between the disabled miners and the United Mine Workers goes back to the probably the early and mid 50s. Before that, the United Mine Workers Welfare and Retirement Fund uh, gave pension benefits, medical benefits, to disabled miners, widows of miners, and orphans of miners. And then during the 50s, when things began to slow down in the coal industry, they began to eliminate one after another of those benefits. So then there was a group that was organized called the Disabled Miners and Widows Association, and there was kind of a feeling among them that by the United Mine Workers people, like they were the enemies. Well, the Vista workers were working with, with that group primarily, and uh, they, they had begun to do some things. They had, in fact, talked with uh, Warren McGraw, who at that time was a, a, a legislator, a, a delegate from Wyoming County. And he also started, you know, to, to work up a proposal for a change in the black lung law. So there were all these uh, different groups kind of working towards the same direction. And then after the Black Lung Association was formed, they, everybody really joined together and, uh, and they, they helped uh, along right with everybody else. So it was a, it was a combined effort. These, uh, these were very, very, very competent and good people and a number of them were still still around here doing real good work. I'm sure you've uh, met Craig Robinson, uh, this guy named uh, uh, John Klein. Uh, there are a number of them that are still around here. And, uh, they were they're very, very helpful people. <clears throat> One of the things, uh, Pete wanted to maybe talk a little bit more about, um, you talked about how you got interested in using the blood gases and mm -hmm. the exercise and, and all of that. Can you talk about that a little bit more, why that was important? Because it seems like that really made a difference in, 
in being able to measure some um, some type of disability? Um, sure. Well, the as I mentioned, I was I I felt that these miners who were ex telling me their their shortness of breath, their the history of how it felt out of them, I felt they really had impairment. So I thought, well, let's let's try like we did with the with the odd cases, the fibrotic cases uh, that we saw in, in Denver and the San Antonio. And so uh, that's when I, I asked them to get the blood gas analyzer. And as soon as we began to study these people with exercise, we began to find those that did show impairment in, in their ability to oxygenate their blood. And uh, so we, we simply pursued this. And it was sufficiently common, as far as I was concerned, that that was kind of a unique finding among coal miners that was different than what you would expect from ordinary cigarette smoking, which would generally produce chronic obstructive lung disease or the you know, bronchitis emphysema type thing with airway obstruction and bad breathing tests. Uh, and of course, uh, at that time, uh, there was no way I could say, well, uh, this miner has uh, airway obstruction and emphysema due to coal mining, he was a smoker, no way to distinguish those two, but this this group that had the uh, impairment in uh, blood gases uh, was a little different, and and basically that's where I uh, centered my attention back in those days, uh, and that that was what was happening. I think what happened uh, what happened fairly early on after we began to do this, there were some of these people who, for example, had uh, applied for social security disability, but were denied because they didn't have enough breathing abnormalities uh, to qualify. But when we exercised them, they certainly had enough impairment to meet the standards for disability social security. And then they began to, we began to, they, evidence was then presented to the workers' comp uh, board, or the occupation of pneumoconiosis, the old silicosis medical board. And there was a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, disagreement, and I used to go down and, and testify uh, there, and there were some miners who were able to get some benefits that they hadn't been able to get. And I think this probably attracted the attention of, of a number of miners who then you know, wanted to see if, if they had this kind of impairment, and that's the kind of thing that, that built up. And, uh, and that, to me, was, was what, what really you know, intrigued me in, in going on and pushing for this thing. And then what we found was that uh, miners with simple pneumoconiosis or even a very scant amount of x-ray abnormality could show the same kind of impairment. It was not limited to those that had uh, progressive massive fibrosis or the large shadows in the lung. And I think that, that was perhaps a revolutionary thing uh, back in those days at least. Um, did you, in, in Washington, when, with the hearings for the um, Federal Act, did you bring miners, or you said Ken Hancock brought miners there? Did you t do their blood gases? In many of them, yes. Can you can you talk about that? Well, I had done I had done many of these studies, and, and what Ken would do would say, can you can you can you ask so and so if I could talk to him? And then he would bring these. He would pay their own way. He would pay their transportation and housing to come to Washington and testify before these uh, committees. And that's that's how we kind of worked that out. But he he was the one that. Uh, invited them, paid their way, and had them testify. Did they do exercise, though? I believe they did. I wasn't there, but I believe they did. They had, uh, they had a doctor from the public health service that uh, kind of uh, uh, monitored them, and I think they did that right there in one of the committee hearings. But I, I wasn't there to see that, so I don't know what really happened. But I heard that that's what they did. Um, so we have... Um, the compensation battle moved beyond West Virginia to other states and then certainly in the federal arena. And, you know, it looked pretty good for miners. Um, what about the intervening years in terms of um, compensation for Well, none of us had even thought of a federal compensation uh, program. We were interested in dust control, dust suppression of the mines, improve safety as well. And that was what our focus was. But a guy named Congressman Burton from San Francisco, where there are no coal miners, 
Conservatives. He was on the Labor Sub Select Labor Subcommittee. And he said, he said, all right, what I think you should do is put in a compensation provision for those miners who were disabled, who did not get workers, state workers' comp. And uh, he said, if, if you don't put this in there, I will support the bill. So uh, that was the origin of the uh, federal black lung uh, compensation program. And uh, that was, again, a, a tough fight. And, uh, and finally, it, it won. And again, here, here Tony Boyle from United Mine Workers opposed that, uh, said, well, that'll kill the whole bill. And of course, it, it was very much opposed by Nixon, as you know. But that provision really, although it has been abused in several respects, it was a godsend to a lot of coal miners who who had had disabling impairment, whose statute of limitations was passed, who could never collect any state compensation. And there were many, many, many deserving uh, disabled miners that did get some monetary benefits and some medical benefits that, that did help them. Not many of their lives were saved, but at least their last years were a little bit more secure and comfortable than they used to be. And so it was, it was a true godsend to many to many of these miners. But the, um, it's changed though, right, in terms of the, um, the burden or standard of proof oh, for compensation? If you look at the history of, the, of that act, you see and the changes, that it's just, it's just like a, like a uh, roller coaster. The very, first, uh, the very first part of it, starting in 1970, Nixon had insisted that it be very severe. So what was required was x-ray evidence of pneumoconiosis, unless you had complicated. Complicated, that was an automatic thing. You had to have x-ray evidence of pneumoconiosis. Then you had to be sufficiently impaired that you could meet Social Security disability requirements, which were very severe, the most severe there, there are, really. And uh, so as a consequence, there, there, was a, there were a lot of people that were, were denied benefits. And Congress then decided in 1972 to amend the law, basically to liberalize it a little bit. And what happened then was they passed a law which the 1972 amendments were really very good. First of all, they, they put in the presumption clause, which West Virginia's miners had gotten in their, their struggle in 1969. They said, if a miner had worked so many years in the mine and had a disabling impairment, it was presumed, it was a rebuttable presumption, but it was presumed that their disability was at least in part due to their coal mine employment. And that if a miner was sufficiently impaired so that he couldn't perform his last regular coal mine job, that he, that was considered what the, what the measurement was for total disability. Sounded wonderful. We were, we were related. We all knew Nixon was going to veto the bill because it was just too good. But he signed it. And then they began to talk about the regulations. And I, I had a conference with uh, two people from the uh, Social Security Administration, the, the uh, man in charge of the disability section and the chief medical officer. And we had a dinner meeting in Charleston. And we were talking about They asked me what I'd, what I'd recommend. And I said, well, why don't you give so much uh, credit on FEVO and increase the level of FEVO and, and uh, 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 raise the standards for blood gas abnormalities and so forth. And we discussed this back and forth. And as we were leaving the meeting, I was getting off the elevator to go home. They said, well, what about if we uh, said that anybody with uh, simple pneumoconiosis or pneumoconiosis qualified? And I said, well, boy, you're going a lot further than I would go. But that's exactly what they did. So then in 1972, and I, I believed then, and I still believe that this was part of the Nixon re-election overkill. Is that anyway, automatically then probably 275,000 miners automatically were granted federal black lung benefits without any evidence of the, any impairment. And then they said uh, that <coughs> they, would, they set the ventilatory standard, and they set it at one standard. So that if somebody was an old man and was perfectly normal for his age, he'd still meet the requirements and qualify. But they didn't change the blood gas standards. They were still the same as Social Security disability standards. And, and so at any rate, after that huge influx, 
then that, after about a year and a half, then that reverted back to the same standards that were in place before the 1972 amendments. And then they kept working and finally passed the, uh, the 1977 amendments in uh, 1978 was when they actually disabled miners that did get some monetary benefits and some medical benefits that, that did help them. Not many of their lives were saved, but at least their last years were a little bit more secure and comfortable than they used to be. And so it was, it was a true godsend to many, to many of these miners. But the, um, it's changed though, right, in terms of the, um, the burden or standard of proof oh, for compensation? If you look at the history of, the, of that act, you see and the changes, that it's, just, it's just like a, like a uh, roller coaster. The very, first, uh, the very first part of it, starting in 1970, Nixon had insisted that it be very severe. So what was required was x-ray evidence of pneumoconiosis, unless you had complicated. Complicated, that was an automatic thing. You had to have x-ray evidence of pneumoconiosis. Then you had to be sufficiently impaired that you could meet social security disability requirements, which were very severe, the most severe there, there are, really. And uh, so as a consequence, there, there was a there were a lot of people that were, were denied benefits. And Congress then decided in 1972 to amend the law, basically to liberalize it a little bit. And what happened then was they passed a law which the 1972 amendments were really very good. First of all, they, they put in the presumption clause, which West Virginia's miners had gotten in their, their struggle in 1969. They said, if a miner had worked so many years in the mine and had a disabling impairment, it was presumed, it was a rebuttable presumption, but it was presumed that their disability was at least in part due to their coal mine employment. And that if a miner was sufficiently impaired so that he couldn't perform his last regular coal mine job, that he, that was considered what the, what the measurement was for total disability. Sounded wonderful. We were, we were related. We all knew Nixon was going to veto the bill because it was just too good. But he signed it. And then they began to talk about the regulations. And I, I had a conference with uh, two people from the uh, Social Security Administration, the, the uh, man in charge of the disability section and the chief medical officer. And we had a dinner meeting in Charleston and we were talking about it. They asked me what I'd, what I'd recommend. And I, said, well, why don't you give so much uh, credit on FEU and increase the level of FEV1 and, and uh, 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 raise the standards for blood gas abnormalities and so forth. And we discussed this back and forth. And as we were leaving the meeting, I was getting off the elevator to go home. They said, well, what about if we uh, said that anybody with uh, simple pneumoconiosis or pneumoconiosis qualified? And I said, well, boy, you're going a lot further than I would go. But that's exactly what they did. So then in 1972, and I, I believed then, and I still believe that this was part of the Nixon re-election overkill. Is to, anyway, automatically then probably 275,000 miners automatically were granted federal black lung benefits without any evidence of the, any impairment. And then they said uh, that <coughs> they, would, they set the ventilatory standard, and they set it at one standard so that if somebody was an old man and was perfectly normal for his age, he'd still meet the requirements and qualify. But they didn't change the blood gas standards. They were still the same as Social Security disability standards. And, and so at any rate, after that huge influx, then that, after about a year and a half, then that reverted back to the same standards that were in place before the 1972 amendments. And then they kept working and finally passed the, uh, the 1977 amendments in uh, 1978 was when they actually were passed. And that, that put some more reality in it. It continued the, the uh, uh, presumption clause, but it went back to the standards that had been set in 1972 about what, what amounted to disability. So that for a time, it was pretty good. There were still some amendments that made it a little more advantageous than perhaps was realistic. Then in 1981, they reintroduced the requirement for x-ray abnormality, 
and, and that's where we are today. And right now, half of those individuals who meet the medical requirements are denied because of the x-ray abnormality. So that's where we are right now. But it's been like this. <coughs> you talked about um, the, the, the changes um, in, in uh, say, dust controls and conditions in the mines and so you haven't seen, or one would think you wouldn't see, I'm sure you haven't seen as many miners with, or have you? What's, what's happened? Oh, oh I, I, I firmly believe that there has been significant improvement in, in underground coal mines in terms of dust uh, control. I do not believe it's perfect and I do not believe it's been good enough. But there has to be, uh, it has to have had a, a significant improvement. Now that's all it took. But still, when the law was enacted, they, they estimated that the two milligram standard, which was the set uh, went, uh, the, that would eliminate the, the uh, presence of simple pneumoconiosis except for a small percentage, maybe 2% after 30 years of coal mining. Well, that has not been achieved. The, the incidence is considerably higher than that. And it continues to be high even among miners that first began to work after the 1969 law became effective. NIOSH now has a good deal of information and, and knows that this is absolutely true. Plus the fact that miners continue to lose pulmonary function uh, as well, uh, even now with the standards. Now, the question is whether the two milligram sample is truly adequate or whether it's really truly ever been met. Now, I'm sure you've heard about the, the, the scandals on uh, 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 dust measurements, dust sampling, which leaves a great question. And, uh, but it's sufficiently of a concern that NIOSH would like to reduce the level to say 0.9 to 1 milligram instead of 2. And in some instances, for example, long wall, that, that probably cannot be achieved. Uh, but I understand some of the companies are actually introducing uh, uh, ventilators for their miners uh, in long wall sections, which would be a very, very good move. But I think there's no question that it has improved. Now, there, some of the surface mining operations have not improved because initially the surface mining people weren't even included in the act. But now they know that uh, that in certain uh, occupations in surface mining there is a, a very high risk of silicosis. In fact, uh, a, a few weeks ago, on one day. I saw two men, 140, 141, with uh, uh, fewer than 20 years of surface mine uh, drillers who had uh, category B complicated pneumoconiosis, which was, was almost as bad as you can get, and who did have significant impairment. They were young men. They, they will not survive many years, and uh, that was the situation. Now, things, I'm sure, have improved in the mines where they were working. But uh, at least up to that point, it was not adequate, and uh, and uh, so there's been there's been there's a quite a, a fairly high percentage of uh, surface miners who do have X-ray evidence of pneumoconiosis. So here in um, 1999, <coughs> are you still seeing complicated pneumoconiosis? We are still seeing a complicated pneumoconiosis. Uh, uh, in 1993, I was I was at a, in a, I was a consultant for NIOSH, and some people there asked me. If I had seen a miner with a complicated pneumoconiosis who had only worked since 1970, and at that time I, I said no. But now, at this time, I have seen at least five miners with complicated pneumoconiosis who uh, began working after 1970. So it still occurs. And that's among underground miners. And, and also, that's not counting the surface miners that I just mentioned. So it still occurs much, much less frequently, I'm sure. But the other problem is that complicated pneumoconiosis may not show up until years after. Uh, what, one of the one of the of the miners who, who is, is one of my friends, uh, uh, who's now a patient of mine, we studied him in 1968 and 1971 after he had finished was working in the mines. He never spoke. At that time, he had scant X-ray changes and no impairment. He was healthy. By the time I saw him again in uh, 1989, he had 
category B complicated pneumoconiosis and has progressively deteriorated since that time. And that was, that's a long time, but you see how long it can take and how the fact that it is, continues to be in many cases, or at least in some cases, probably a minority, but it continues to be an active disease process. So people who have even the simplest um, cases, beginnings of changes, need to get out of the work environment? Yes, they need to get out of the working environment but it may in some cases even be too late then. That the same for, um, I've always known that about silicosis. We're beginning to say the same thing about pneumoconiosis that yes. progresses. Yes, yes, yes. Co Co-workers pneumoconiosis, which, which actually depends on, on, on silicon dioxide, uh, at least in part, probably, to get the disease going and to uh, keep it going. So it, it is, yes, I've talked about an underground coal miner that, was, that developed. I have, I've had, a, I don't know how many of the miners that I have seen and followed that subsequently developed complicated pneumoconiosis years after they left the mines. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me that, um, that you, you met miners as in the process probably of seeing them as patients, and you became friends with them. That happened sure. a lot? Oh, yes. Yes, I, 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 uh, I've spent time in miners' homes. Uh, they've been in my home. Uh, it's, 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 it's been a good, a good association. One of my best friends was uh, Arnold Miller, and uh, I spent a lot of time traveling with uh, Arnold long before he uh, became president of the United Mine Workers, and even after that. Uh, uh, there were a good number of miners that are uh, good friends. As I say, though, a lot of them have, uh, have died. So much for the your friends back uh, out west oh, who yes. told you you'd come back in three months. Oh yes, no, they were so wrong, uh, so absolutely wrong that uh, nothing could have been more incorrect than their impression. They, they, I admire these coal miners. I, I really, truly do because they are really good, courageous, hardworking people now. And, uh, I, I've been, I, I felt really, really. Uh, blessed to be able to have associated with these guys, and I bet miners from all over the country. When when uh, when the UMW business was going on, we, we I met miners from uh, all over all over the uh, United States, and just fine fine people. Um, <clears throat> what do you see about, um, or what would you say about what do you think is going to happen in terms of uh, changes in mining, uh, besides the mines closing down, but any hope for miners in terms of this disease? I, I think that there's hope. I, I think, truly, I think the, the people in the coal industry are not interested in, in, in creating disease among their uh, miners. I think that even for that matter, uh, it's an economic uh, situation, I mean, aside from humanitarian considerations. If they can prevent they can prevent disease among their miners, then this is going to save them uh, immense uh, compensation costs in the future, and I and I believe that uh, that they will uh, will uh, will do so, and I think there'll be some 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 significant movements in that direction. I, I I believe that quite firmly. I think that the total mining force is continuing to diminish as the mechanization improves, but I think they'll begin to take better care of those miners that they do have. Frankly, that's, that's, that's my opinion, at least it's my hope, but I believe that that'll be the case. That's it for, for that part. Oh, okay. Can we just continue? Um, how much? I just wanted to, this is what I had asked you about before, if you could just, you know, briefly explain how the respiratory system works and what happens to dust of different sizes and, and in terms of where it deposits and, and why we're concerned about invisible dust. Sure. All right, well, the, basically the respiratory system uh, consists of nose, mouth, uh, major airways like the trachea and the large breathing tubes, the bronchi. Those breathing tubes continue to branch into smaller and smaller divisions and 
then you get into some areas where there begin to be uh, small air sacs. They were very tiny, what's called alveoli, that is uh, the smallest unit in the uh, lung. Then gradually it, it turns out that the end, almost everything is these small uh, balloon-like structures, very, very tiny, uh, that are thin-walled. They are surrounded by capillaries. And it's in those units where uh, oxygen enters the bloodstream, enters the red blood cells, and carbon dioxide is excreted. The oxygen is brought into the lung when the when it inhales, and the carbon dioxide is exhaled when when it lets its breath out, and that's the that's the normal mechanism. This requires the, the movement of air and then the flow of blood. In situations where you have and the the the, the lining of the large tubes is uh, uh, covered with with the small hair-like structures that tend to to beat uh, towards the uh, upper airway that tend to remove large particles of stuff. So if you're in a situation, in a dusty situation, a lot of the large particles, well, first of all, they'll stop at your nose and in the upper airways and along the, the tracheal and bronchial tree. And, and most of those, while they may irritate the, the structures, they are, they are removed. But when you get into very tiny particles, uh, like two to five microns, very small. Those uh, uh, particles are sufficiently small that they can actually enter into the uh, small air sacs uh, or into the very small airways. And they can become lodged there and they will not be removed by this usual uh, uh, mechanism of cleansing. Those particles are then usually engulfed by uh, macrophages or phagocytic cells that are there to defend against infection and various other things. They're taken back through the alveolar wall, the thin alveolar wall. They are then, uh, many of them are then transported out of the lung through lymphatics and it can actually, the lung can actually be cleared in that mechanism so that you could end up with with uh, complete cleansing in that respect. But if the load becomes too excessive and there's more dust than those macrophages can, they can clear, then that dust can be deposited in, in lo local areas, uh, frequently around the smallest uh, breathing tube. And uh, then they can set up a process that can uh, lead to the accumulation of dust, which can either be a, like a solid little mass or which can end up uh, kind of destroying some of the surrounding uh, lung tissue. And this, those two processes can lead to what's called co-workers pneumoconiosis. Uh, silicosis has some of the same features producing primarily the solid nodular type that can also lead some problems. But in, a, in addition to that, the cells, those same type of phagocytic cells, the macrophages that pick up the dust, can be changed in, in various in, throughout the lung itself. Those cells then start secreting certain chemicals. And those chemicals can do a lot of things. They attract other types of cells. This process can cause two types of damage to the lung. It can cause scarring or fibrosis of the lung, the lung of the, of the small breathing tank, or it can destroy them and actually produce emphysema. In addition, of course, it can, the, the dust can cause bronchitis and also can, can surround the small airways and produce problems like that. But I think the two primary processes that cause impairment are the combination of the fibrosis and the emphysema. And those two things, I believe, are what really causes most of the impairment, although the small airways themselves may play a role in the, in the impairment as well. So basically, that's the process. And it, it can occur, this alveolar, what's called an al alveolitis, it's a, it's a cellular inflammation. This can occur independent of the x-ray or the shadows or the lesions that cause pneumoconiosis, because you can find minors who have a lot of pneumoconiosis, either when you look at the lung or when you look at the x-ray, they may have absolutely no impairment. They may never have. But they also do not have this 
active inflammatory process in their alveoli. Now those minors that do have that alveolar process can develop emphysema and fibrosis and that alveolar process can continue to be active even after minors leave their, even if they're no longer exposed, this can go on perhaps indefinitely, we don't really know. And that can lead to progression in certain minors. It's a distinct minority, but it can occur in those minors. So that's the process that you're dealing with. It isn't simply a matter of collections of, of dust and, and the reaction of the tissues to that dust uh, macular or nodule in the lung. It's what happens in all of the lung tissue and that alveolar, uh, active alveolar inflammation that takes place. And that's basically what, what causes the trouble. Now you can, this process is, is much greater in those minors who have uh, large mass densities, but even some minors with large mass densities have no real impairment. So it's, it's a process that's really independent of what you look at on an x-ray. This is why in the lab we can see somebody with extensive x-ray abnormalities and no impairment, nothing at all wrong. And, uh, and, and others with very little or maybe even nothing can have significant impairment. It's related not to the, the, the size of the shadows or even the microscopic lesions themselves, but uh, to what's going on in the rest of the lung tissue. Kent? Whew. I'm down to residency. One of our fellow residents uh, had discussed the fact they had a cold, they had a, a, a GI that had had a lung biopsy and he had this strange disease. This guy from New Jersey said, well, it's cold pneumoconiosis. He says a lot of, a lot of people used to moonlight and deliver coal and uh, they could get this from delivering coal. That's the only thing I'd ever known about it. I, I, mm. I, I absolutely didn't come here with the idea of uh, doing anything to do with lung sickness. I mean, I didn't have any idea about it. Mm. Okay, so could you explain the difference between simple and uh, complicated co-workers okay. pneumoconiosis and talk about progressive yeah. All right. Well, by, by definition, uh, simple co-workers pneumoconiosis, which is usually defined by x-ray changes and or pathologic changes, but x-ray changes, occurs when you have a number of uh, small rounded shadows or, uh, that are anywhere from barely visible up to uh, about uh, uh, nine millimeters in diameter. If you have an x-ray shadow w which exceeds a centimeter in diameter, then that is considered complicated pneumoconiosis. It's kind of an arbitrary, arbitrary marking point. And then if you get larger and larger opacities, then you get uh, into uh, Category A would be the, the 10 to, uh, to 4.9 uh, centimeters, and above 5 you get category B, and then greater than that you get uh, category C. Pathologically, they would, the pathologist would like to say that you should have one 3 centimeters to be complicated, but the x-ray definition is 1 centimeter. All right. The, the, basically, there's, there's no real difference uh, in, in those, except that usually the ones with the greatest accumulation of dust uh, are the ones more likely to develop the complicated pneumoconiosis. And it's called progressive massive fibrosis in some instances because those lesions can enlarge as time goes by, even again after uh, exposure stops. And uh, uh, not only they can enlarge, but uh, function uh, deteriorates as well. Function can deteriorate whether those things change or not. And sometimes they, there's, there's so little change that uh, some of the people used to say, well, it's, uh, it's not uh, progressive at all. Uh, and it may not even be fibrosis. I mean, those are just some of the things that they used to talk about when they first came here. But on, on a statistical average, those individuals with complicated pneumoconiosis have more impairment than the average of simple pneumoconiosis. But there's no, there's no clear-cut delineation. As I said before, you can have individuals who have rather extensive complicated pneumoconiosis with really no significant impairment, and then minors with 
little or no simple pneumoconiosis with a great deal of impairment. And you can never predict by looking at the x-ray, except statistically, the minors with complicated have more impairment than those with simple pneumoconiosis. But it's basically a, a determined on the, the, the size of the lesions itself, but by definition. You could recollect how many, yeah, about 45 so you want to ask that again? To 50,000. Yes. Okay. So studied in fairly detail. So you could just say over your, you know, the time that you've done this, is that, is, are you ready? Well, I've evaluated anywhere from 45 to 50,000 coal miners plus a, another 10,000 other types of lung disease. But we've, we've seen that many in the lab over the time since, since we started in 1963. And again, did you, do you have a sense of how many cases of uh, coal workers in pneumoconiosis you've seen? Well, a good majority of those have had x-ray evidence of pneumoconiosis. A minority of them have significant impairment. Back years ago, maybe a quarter of them had uh, at least moderate impairment and some more severe. Right now, it's considerably uh, fewer than that. Maybe uh, seven to ten percent have significant impairment, or maybe even less now. So it has diminished uh, considerably over the uh, over the period uh, in the last thirty plus years. But I'm sure that this is reflected by the I mean, it's a reflection of improvement in, in environmental conditions in the mines. Mm 